Hey everyone, this is Dr. Blakeney. I am in uh, Seneca Falls, New York. And if you're a history buff, you might know this is the birthplace of women's rights in the United States, at least the formal birthplace of civil rights in the United States. A couple of women from here uh, and from the area, uh, they were attending an anti-slavery convention in London in 1840, uh, the World Anti-Slave Congress. And what happened was uh, the men of the conference decided that the women wouldn't get the right to vote and they would not be able to participate in uh, the formal, they had to go sit in the back basically and literally and so the women started talking the americans started talking and by 1848 they decided to have a convention so in 1848 right here in this chapel uh, about 300 people met and they ended up coming up with a declaration of sentiments which starts off very similar to the Declaration of Independence, and it follows the same pattern where there are grievances, but they made changes. For example, they wrote, uh, we hold these truths self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And then they went through and they talked about some of the rights that women didn't have at the time. For example, uh, if you owned uh, uh, property, uh, you would not necessarily uh, get that property, uh, things like that. So women did that. However, the idea of suffrage or the idea of voting was not something that was super popular at, in 1848. And so even this convention had trouble adding that. While we think about this as being women's suffrage and the birthplace of women's suffrage is actually the birthplace of women's rights and suffrage was a part of that. Frederick Douglass, who was an abolitionist and an anti-slavery uh, advocate, a former slave himself, he's, he was talking to the convention. He said, excuse me, but how are you going to get all these rights that you want if you don't have the right to vote? And so they added that uh, to the document. Out of the 300 people, about 100 of them signed it. 68 women and 32 men. And a lot of them might not have signed it, the other 200, because they were fearful for what would happen to them back in their communities if they signed uh, this document. And so eventually, after World War I in uh, 1919, uh, the idea of suffrage for women passed uh, Congress, and it was time to go through. This is right after World War I. Women had done a lot, and so they decided to uh, add uh, women's suffrage as, as kind of um, recognizing the, the advancements of women uh, in terms of work and in what they had done, etc., etc. And so they had to get 36 states to pass. So once an amendment is written in Congress and passes Congress, it has to be passed by three-fourths of the states, which was 36. And it came down, there are 35 states, and Tennessee uh, was the state that finally uh, made the 36th uh, state to pass, and that's how women's suffrage passed in 1920. But it's crazy because in Tennessee, the legislature was deadlocked, 50% on one side, 50% on the other side. And the person that passed the deciding vote by not doing what his party wanted him to do, actually had received a telegram from his mother uh, the night before saying, hey, you should pass this. So that's how women's suffrage passed in 1920. Uh, some of the famous people that were here, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, we have Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass, the McClintocks. Uh, there were uh, quite a few people who were very, very um, progressive for their time. And so here, 19, uh, sorry, 1848, the Women's um, Convention on Rights passed the Declaration of Sentiments. All right, I hope that gives you a pretty good background on uh, the beginning of women's rights. There's so much more, but this just starts it here in Seneca Falls, and I look forward to seeing you in the classroom soon. Take care. Bye-bye.